Welcome everyone to the Av Safety podcast series presented by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. This series explores a whole variety of air safety related topics with hints and tips helpful for our everyday flying. I'm Tim Penny and joining me is Leah Vesich as your hosts. You will hear interesting stories from our industry, including pilots and aviation experts, aviators such as yourselves involved in different areas of aviation who are willing to share their stories and experiences so we can all learn from each other. And whether we fly three times a week or three times a year, it doesn't really matter. There's always something we can learn to ensure optimal safety. For more information on a wide range of safety issues, visit our website, www.casa.gov.au forward slash pilots. Pilot decision making during hazards and emergencies is the key to survival and these decisions are related to pre-flight preparation. Every day pilots implement the rules, responsibilities and safety checks for flying but emergencies still happen and it's our additional responsibility to learn from them. In this episode, you'll discover how preparation helps us fly at our best, prepare for the worst and maximise our chance at the best outcome in emergency situations. I was fortunate to grow up in Switzerland with um, some expat parents and my godfather worked for Swissair. And so we would spend a lot of time at at Zurich Airport and my earliest memory is the linoleum floors with those little uh, rivets that you might know that I'm talking about where the trolleys run over them and make the little rubbery noise. This is Alexander Robinson. He's the Director of Aviation and Defence at Seeing Machines. He's a passionate aviator and has found himself in some hairy situations as a result of inadequate planning. And I'd remember that sound, I'd remember the smell, and I'd remember the clickety-clack of the old school flight boards. And against the backdrop of all that was the, the smell of jet fuel. And that memory just permeates where I just have this, this earliest recollection of being around aircraft and seeing my godfather, who looked after catering for Swiss Air, and having a couple of opportunities to go in the aircraft, to be close to them, to even sit in the cockpit, And I think that's what started my love of of aviation. Moving to Australia when I was 12, um, one of my my school friends, his dad actually owned uh, General Flying Services, which many listeners would would probably remember. And being friends with him was a great opportunity to hang around the flying school, occasionally go for a fly. Ross Carrington let me uh, fly with him under supervision a couple of times. And then I would go and work for uh, him during the school holidays, helping clean aircraft, helping gap spark plugs and things like that. So I was around aviation as a a school kid. And then that matured or fostered into a uh, a want to be a pilot. And I thought pretty hard about what sort of pilot I wanted to be when I was at school. I looked at Embry-Riddle as an example to uh, to try to learn to fly and go into a a commercial pilot career. Which is an American institution? That's right, yeah, in Florida. And I've got my mum to thank for that. She she really encouraged me to look at the civilian side because from her perspective, the alternative was the military. And my perspective was partly influenced by Top Gun, I'm sure, but that uh, military flying was the the pinnacle of a career in aviation. It was the ultimate uh, challenge. And so I set myself a goal pretty early at school, probably in year 10 or 11, And so that manifested into joining the Air Force uh, in 2003, spent three years at at ADFA, then went to pilot training uh, flying CT4s in Tamworth, followed by PC9s in Perth. The problem was I didn't want it enough. I wanted to be an Air Force pilot because I thought an Air Force pilot was the ultimate challenge and, and a cool job. I didn't want to be an Air Force pilot for the right reasons. So I didn't study as hard as I could have I failed some flights and ultimately I didn't succeed in achieving my wings. That was really hard for me at the time. Even though I didn't want it enough, that didn't mean that I still hadn't tried really hard to get it. And what that uh, sort of resulted in was I was really, really sad when when I didn't get my wings. I uh, took a lot of time out from aviation. I actually spent 10 years between my last flight in a PC-9 and my, my next flight in a Warrior. And I went and did something completely different. I worked for Caterpillar. I stayed away from aviation. But about eight years into Caterpillar, I missed aviation. And I 
tried to find a way to come back to it. And I'm really glad I did it that way because I, I came back on my terms. I started flying again the way I wanted to fly. I enjoyed it. And so that manifested in, in co-founding Early, an aviation startup, which got me back into aviation. I started flying again thanks to the encouragement of my partner. And then uh, now I work for Seeing Machines in an aviation capacity. And I get to speak to pilots and aviation professionals from all domains. And I fly. Very fascinating story, and it just goes to show that there's so many different avenues in uh, in aviation that you can take. Well, today you're here to share a story that hopefully some of our listeners can take away um, some of your insights uh, and learn from them. Can you start off by telling us what was the pre-flight plan for this particular flight? So the flight that I actually thought I'd reflect on was one of my Air Force flights. So it was a PC-9 out of Perth, or out of Pierce. The, uh, the flight was called the Advanced Handling Test, which was about halfway through the, uh, the course. And it was, as you start to go from transitioning onto the PC-9 and learning how to fly the PC-9 to learning how to operate it as a platform. So some of the advanced uh, maneuvers, some, um, some more difficult mission profiles. And the curriculum is pretty clearly defined for the Advanced Handling Test. You've got a, a senior examiner in the back seat and, and me as the the pilot in the front seat being assessed. So with the curriculum known, one of the, the key things was to do a practice force landing, which every pilot has done um, in getting their PPL, RPL, CPL, etc. PC-9 was no different, even though it's got an ejection seat, um, we still don't want to throw away a jet if we don't have to. So um, I hear they're pretty expensive. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I knew that there was going to be a, a PFL, practice force landing, in the, the flight. And everyone, all my course mates debrief each other on, uh, on what, when you can expect it, which examiners are typical, typically giving it when. So you kind of try to game the system a bit, even though it's still a, a core competency. So I took off out of Pierce, was flying to a regional aerodrome called Jinjin, which was about a 15 minute flight away, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 miles. And I was expecting a PFL on the way. Now, on a previous flight, an instructor had shown me a dirt airstrip halfway between Pierce and Jinjin, so about 15 miles away, that was suitable for a forced landing if need be. And he'd shown me it once, and I knew that it was uh, probably somewhere on my right as I was flying towards Jinjin. And then all of a sudden, I felt the, the throttle go to idle. The instructor had, had pulled it back and said, practice, which meant, OK, we're doing a forced landing now. I was at about 3,000 feet. and. Uh, well, actually, I was about 4,000 feet, and I was looking for this aerodrome. I thought, okay, I've got my plan, which is that there is an aerodrome directly below me to my right that I knew, based on where I was, should be there. Jinjin was about 10 miles away. So I start doing an orbit at 4,000, expecting to see this aerodrome, and it's nowhere. I couldn't find it. Even though I'm looking at my map, I'm looking at where I was, and I knew it should be there. So I do one orbit, I do two orbits, by now, I'm probably about 2,500. And I go, OK, I'm now at a high key height for a, a practice force landing. I can't find this aerodrome. I need to go to Jinjin. There are some criteria that we had to meet to pass the advanced handling test and to successfully conduct a force landing, which is to hit high key at 2,500 and to hit low key at 1,500. And if you don't do either of those, um, you are likely to fail. So I didn't hit high key at 2,500 but continued to proceed because I could see the, the threshold. I could see that I was likely to make it and elected to continue. And I probably verbalized this, but not very clearly. Passing uh, about 1,100, I reached the threshold or a beam the threshold. So I was 400 feet below low key. Again, that should have been criteria to simulate an ejection and uh, abort the forced landing, but I elected to continue. Um, air traffic controller buzzing in my ear saying, uh, what are your intentions? Is your gear down, etc." cetera? And, and I had configured for landing and I'd, I'd done all my checks. But the key parts were I was below high key and I was below low key as I turned onto base and then final. Now, I made the landing. Um, we landed successfully. If that were a real world situation, I saved the jet. We didn't have to eject. We didn't risk injury. But I didn't meet the criteria for a force landing. And so continued the flight and then landed back at Pierce. 
and was told I'd failed that flight because of that very early error in not hitting high key and low key. And I was quite annoyed about that because I felt that I had done the right things in saving the jet and treating it as a real world emergency, but I hadn't met a couple of procedural requirements. Now the lesson in that was uh, two, p two parts. One was um, I didn't verbalize this to the instructor and I've always found verbalizing when I'm under mental load quite difficult because uh, you're focused on flying the aircraft. But Air Force typically requires you to, to communicate back to the instructor because they can't read your thoughts and they can't necessarily see what you're doing. So I didn't verbalize that. But even though that was 12 years ago now and you know I've put the Air Force not working out for me behind me, I still really like that lesson because it shows me that there is a difference between real world and planning. And you know, I had a plan which was to find that dirt strip. I didn't find it, I had to adapt my plan. I didn't meet some of the procedures, but I saved the aircraft. And I think that what that taught me is I should have had a better plan for if I didn't spot that airfield. And so now what I try to bring from that is when I go flying in, in a Cessna, when I go flying with a friend, what, not, not, not the, the first order of, of plan, but what are the second and third order possibilities that could happen and how can I go through a mental exercise of planning for them? Because I think if you, if you plan for them, if you think about them, if you chair fly them, then you're far more likely to be successful when you go into that situation. So a lot of what you're saying there is around that decision-making element, coupling with having that situational awareness to reevaluate in a dynamic environment. So how do you think that that experience has changed the way that you make decisions, particularly in flight and when you're looking at deviating from a flight plan? What that experience has taught me is that I need to be thinking before something happens about where I need to make a decision. And what I mean by that is before I get to an aerodrome or before I'm on final approach at an aerodrome, I need to be thinking well before about when do I need to have a firm rule in my head about aborting this um, plan of action that I have. So, you know, an example recently was I went flying with my dad at the end of last year. And we flew into Lakes Entrance and Lakes Entrance is a, a dirt strip. And I'd been thinking about this dirt strip for a while. So I called up beforehand to make sure that the airstrip was, was in good condition. The operator gave me a 50-50. They said it's a bit wet, but it, it's, it's had aircraft landing. So already that was a warning sign for me that I needed to be mindful as I'm flying overhead Lakes Entrance to, to, to have a look at the airstrip closely as I enter the circuit to be very mindful about if I need to exit, what my plan will be uh, throughout that. So not just on descent into downwind and basin final, but right through to, to late final, right through to if I do land, what, what should I do if uh, we start getting bogged down? What uh, the same, we did land, it was a successful approach, but the lesson from that was that I had started thinking about that even before I took off. And then I was continually adapting that plan as we were flying and I was trying to brief dad on what I was thinking so that he wasn't going to be alarmed. So there's a lot um, of chair flying that you could do before you actually get in an aircraft and really visualize the flight and run through what your options are and it sounds like that's something you did quite often um, in the Air Force uh, through your training and now you've taken that through to your general aviation and private flying as well. Yeah, chair flying is a, a really a good case study or, or thing to discuss, concept to discuss. Chair flying is a good concept to discuss because I found chair flying really difficult. I found it quite boring. I, before I even, uh, you know, denigrate chair flying, I know that there are benefits to it. I know why it's, it's mentally um, and from a preparation perspective so valuable. But I find it really challenging to chair fly because I feel like if you're doing it in real time, it's, uh, it's tremendously inefficient. Having said that, I try to now find ways that I can make chair flying work for me. And that's not necessarily sitting in a chair going through the, the checklists and motions, but trying to find those key moments where a plan might need to change or there's some new information or something that won't work or it's a critical phase of flight. And I'll try to really just focus on those areas and think through them and verbalize them and write them down so that you know that works for me. It's a way that I've found works better than chair flying from 
pre-start to shut down. CASA has a range of resources and events to support the pilot community. Register to attend our free AV safety seminars, to hear about safety issues, talk with us and meet other people in the industry. Visit www.casa.gov.au forward slash avsafety to register. And while you're there, subscribe to our mailing list to stay up to date on information relating to aviation safety resources for all pilots. There is no doubt that pre-flight planning and preparation reduces the pressure and decision-making loads when hazards or emergencies unfold. Let's unpack preparation and the steps to safe flying with an industry expert. From my perspective, uh, really the, the flight is a whole number of things that you've got to get done. And I guess if you have a look at the VFRG, we've got Chapter 2, which is planning your flight. It's actually got 125 pages uh, to get through for pre-flight planning. And that tells you the importance of actually thinking about your flight before it actually you undertake it. This is Terry Horsam, who is an aviation safety advisor at CASA. He's been a professional pilot for 35 years, has flown many regional airlines and has a keen interest in the human factors of flying. He's here to share with us some of the common mistakes made in pre-flight planning and how you can best plan your next flight to ensure it's safe and smooth. Most people would look at the, the weather as being the most important one and quite rightly so because a lot of accidents occur for pilots who have not planned because of weather but there's a lot more to it than just that you know we need to sort of plan all the way through we have to look at contingencies etc so there's there's a whole gamut of things and, and that 125 pages is probably just the beginning of the things that you should be thinking about before you get into a, uh, an aircraft and go for a flight. And what are some common mistakes pilots make when they are pre-flight planning? I think the common mistakes are just to concentrate on the one thing and, and again if we come back to the weather, you know, they'll have a look out the window as you've just quite rightly said and they'll go, well it's a nice day, so off we go and you know, they, they may think that there's no need to look at the weather in their destination, they might think that uh, it's going to be fine all the way through. But I like to sort of refer back to uh, the, the PAVE model for, for a pre-flight checklist and, and that refers to things like the pilot. So it's really sort of pre-flighting yourself. So a lot of pilots forget to actually check on themselves to make sure that they are fit to fly. And if we're recreational pilots, you know, a lot of the time we don't actually have to go flying. Um, we might be doing it just, you know, for fun or we might be taking friends for a flight. But if we're not 100%, you know, the, the, you've got to check yourself out um, to make sure you, you're fit to fly. You might use the I'm safe checklist, which is also a great one to sort of check on illnesses and any medications that you might be taking. But uh, additionally to that, of course, you need to make sure that you're competent on the aircraft you're about to fly, that you're current, that you are not going to exceed your personal limitations. And by that I mean if, if you haven't done crosswinds for a while, have a look at the forecast, if the crosswind at your destination or your departure airfield is in excess of what you think you can handle, then that would be a good reason not to, to go flying. The second part of the PAVE checklist is in fact the aircraft and on the aircraft you're looking at uh, things like airworthiness and I guess over the last uh, you know, couple of years things may have slipped uh, on aeroplane maintenance and so you might be looking at a maintenance release and uh, you know, it might have some outstanding items to, to be fixed by the engineers, uh, they may have, have slipped for some reason or it could be that the maintenance release itself is, is out of date. This is all part of planning, so you're looking at the aircraft side of it, the airworthiness side of it. In the airworthiness side you're also looking at uh, the fuel, uh, we, we've already done a fuel plan but sometimes people forget that you know, you've got to have that physical fuel on board as well. And that's the sort of stuff that uh, you know, you're know you planning. Yes, it, it's great to, to plan, but you've also got to check that that's there. The V is a little bit of a stretch. It's environment, and so you're looking at where you're going flying and the fact that you're going to an airport. You might be familiar with that airport, but it could be that on this particular day you check the NOTAMs and you find that a, a cross strip is closed or something like that. And finally, the E in the PAVE checklist is uh, the external pressures. Is there anything that you can think of that is going to affect your flight today. So, you know, is, is there a 
something happening at home that, that you might sort of think, well, this is, this is going to affect the way I feel about my flying today. Any number of external pressures uh, or stresses can affect the way we fly as well. So I think that's part of your pre-flight. And a lot of people just sort of concentrate on the one thing. They think, oh, yeah, the weather's fine. Let's jump in and go. But there's a, a whole gamut of, of things that you've got to cover off on. You raised some really good points there, particularly with that PAVE model. Acronyms is something pilots are very used to using and memorising. Uh, and in flight planning, I think that's a really good one uh, to have uh, on hand. How important is it to document a flight plan, even if you're flying to somewhere that you're familiar with or that you've flown to quite a number of times, is it worth still going through that process? Absolutely. A lot of pilots forget the, the, the fact that a flight plan is, is necessary. If you're going beyond 50 nautical miles, uh, you really want to have something in, in place uh, to ensure that you're, you're doing your fuel calculations correctly, that you've, you've covered the, the alternate requirements. A lot of people forget about uh, alternate requirements. Could be that you're only going on a short flight that you've been on numerous times before and it might be 100 miles for instance and you get uh, to the point where when we're aviation safety advisors we go out and ask people if they know what the requirements are for alternates as a VFR flight. Most of them don't realise that uh, if you've got a forecast that's below an alternate minimum of 1500 feet ceiling and 8 kilometres flight visibility you've actually got to cover off on a destination alternate. You've got to have somewhere else to go. So even though you might be doing a flight that you've done numerous times before, it's necessary to, to have a look at that sort of stuff. Now, when it comes to lodging a flight plan, not everybody would go through the, uh, uh, the full extent of lodging a flight plan, but as a bare minimum, you might consider using a flight note. And if you go on the uh, AMSA, uh, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority website, they uh, recommend using flight notes. And a flight note is essentially just letting somebody who you trust know that you're going flying, that you expect to be back at a certain time. And if you're not back, then make sure that they understand that they need to ring uh, the, the AMSA number. Now, it might sound a bit strange having Maritime Safety Authority, but they're the people that, that will pick up on your ELT, your, your beacon, and they're the ones that will go looking for you. So even just things like um, just a, a shortish sort of flight, let somebody know that you're going flying. So if anything does go awry, or even if you just land precautionary somewhere, they can contact you. And that way it saves a lot of people a lot of angst, particularly if they have to go looking for you. So this is particularly important in places like designated remote areas. Uh, where a lot of people forget that they are designated remote areas uh, in Australia and I think half of Tasmania is designated remote area uh, and you need to really think about your flying in those particular areas. Yeah, and that's a great point, particularly when we're talking about having backups on board as well. I think we're seeing a growing number of pilots relying largely, if not solely, on EFBs uh, for flight planning, whether it's uh, pre-flight planning or en route. And as we know, devices, uh, like with all technology, can fail on us, and particularly when we're in remote areas of Australia. So what are some of the risks in doing so, in relying on one type of electronic flight plan? and what legal requirements should pilots be aware of if they're doing so? Okay, so the EFB is a great addition to our flying. It's, it's something that's uh, sort of come across uh, we've, in the last uh, you know, five or so years where we find that the majority of people will probably be using uh, electronic flight bags on, in the aircraft. Now, as a substitute for your normal maps, etc., they're fine, but you have to have a backup. There are differences if you're a commercial operator. So if, for instance, you jump into a, an aircraft and go for a scenic flight around the Great Ocean Road or something like that, you might find that your pilot will be using an iPad. But uh, those commercial operators uh, will have all the, the policies and procedures for use of that iPad in their operations manuals. So there's different rules for them uh, opposed to a private pilot. Um, so the rules are, for a private pilot are, yes, use them, make sure you've got a backup, but also remember that you know, it's, it's rubbish in, rubbish out when it comes to those things. So you know, there's a lot of responsibility on you understanding what you're putting into that uh, electronic flight bag because they are dumb and dutiful. They'll do exactly what you've asked them to do, but uh, essentially, as I say, rubbish in, rubbish out. So they're the, the sort of things that I'd definitely be... Uh, aware of for pilots and we're all for them. They're, they're, they're a great uh, addition to your situation awareness 
Um, they, they've got some great features, but be aware that if they do stop, you know, they, if you leave them on the, the combing of the aircraft, uh, they'll soon stop working once the temperature picks up. You've got to have a backup. You've got to be able to at least know where you are. And I think there'll be a few pilots out there that have possibly been on flight reviews recently where they've had an over-reliance on that uh, uh, flight um, bag and the instructor said, OK, it's not working. Where are we? So you've still got to know where you are. You've still got to know the basics. So don't throw the, the basics out because uh, you've got this you know, really great bit of kit. You know, as I say, they, they're, they're really good. We, we love them. But they also come with the, the caveat that uh, you've always got to have the backup and you've got to know what you're, what you're doing, where you are with them. Technology certainly is helping uh, pilots to fly better and more accurately, but you're right, it's rubbish in, rubbish out, and I think that's a key uh, takeaway, at least in terms of understanding not only the, our aircraft and the systems on the aircraft, but the systems that pilots use as well, like EFBs, it's critical in, in using them appropriately. It's one resource, and there's obviously many that pilots use. CASA uh, also produces flight plans resources. Can you talk a bit about them and, and why pilots should get onto the CASA online store and, and download some of those resources? Absolutely. I, I've already referred to the, the VFRG and that should be, that is like the pilot's bible. Um, that's a really highly um, well-produced resource for pilots to have a look at. And as I mentioned, there's 125 pages just on flight planning, but it's also got all the other regulations as well there. Now, the, you can buy a, a hard copy of that, and that's my preference, um, having sort of been around for a while. I, I like to have a book that I can open and, and leave open at a certain page. But uh, that um, resource is also available in PDF form online. So the VFRG is absolutely one of the basics. The other thing that CASA does really well is uh, we, we have a, a flight planning kit and uh, that kit uh, includes a number of, I guess you'd call them decoding cards for things like uh, weather forecasts from the bomb. Uh, it's got some flight plan pads in there. Uh, it's got a, a small ruler, again, sort of taking you back to the, the basics. Uh, there's a number of things there that, uh, that CASA puts out and it's available from the online store, as you mentioned. You can order any number of things from the store and you just pay the, the $15 delivery fee. But it's really well worth having a look at the, the kit. We, we always recommend it to people who are just embarking on their navigation training. But we also would say, look, even if you've been flying for a while, get your hands on one of these kits and, uh, and just see what's there. There's some really good information in there. Now we've heard key insights from Terry. Let's circle back to Alex and hear what lessons he's learned during his time as an aviator. I was lucky to have learned to fly in a very structured, progressive and highly competent environment being in the Air Force. It's certainly not to say that civilian flying schools or, or uh, the way that non-military pilots learn to fly don't have that same structure or quality of training. But for me, I... The, the lessons I learned during military pilot training are still relevant today, particularly around preparation, briefing, and debriefing. So I still try to adhere to, to those elements by being as well prepared as possible, by briefing myself before a flight, and by spending a significant amount of time debriefing in a way that works for me. I no longer have the benefit of that structured environment and that lesson structure that worked so well for me. So I need to try to take elements that I remember from the Air Force and bring them over to my personal preparation. Now let's hear some final thoughts from Terry. One of the big things that people tend to forget is last light. And uh, we've got a requirement that you've planned to, to land 10 minutes before last light. That's the, that's the, the ruling. But, uh, you know, if you've got a flight of an hour, it's not too difficult to lose 10 minutes en route, maybe, you know, diverting around some cloud or whatever it might be. So 10 minutes is not a great buffer. So my, my tip would be for people, particularly with last light, make sure you do consider it. Consider the terrain that you're flying into. If there's high terrain to the west of your airfield, you will find that uh, last light will occur earlier than what you might have calculated. And a lot of people do get caught out with that. It's part of your flight planning but give yourself a reasonable buffer with 
last light. Don't just accept the fact that uh, I'm going to get there 10 minutes before and everything's going to be fine. Give yourself that buffer. So weather might be great. I can guarantee that it always gets dark when when it gets dark. It has done in my lifetime anyway. So don't think it's going to, the daylight's going to extend because it won't. And uh, as I say, don't just concentrate on, on the weather side of it and just accept the fact that it's a nice day. You know, that's how we get complacent. Um, just think, think about all the other aspects of flight planning. Uh, Pre-flight planning, it's, it's essential. And I think there's a truism out there in aviation that uh, truisms are normally come about because something's happened and we all know that proper preparation prevents poor performance. And that's something that, uh, you know, I think uh, is something that we should all remember. If you want to learn more about how you can stay up to date on the topics we've discussed today, check out the information and resources by going to the link in the description. Thank you to our guests for sharing their wisdom, stories and insight. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode. My name is Leah and this is the Av Safety Podcast.